I'm Rachel Nichols, alongside, you know, six-time champion, uh, Scotty uh, Pippen. Yeah. Yeah. But you may also see on set Hall of Famer and star of our latest ESPN Films 30 for 30, Rodman, for better or worse, Mr. Dennis Rodman. Welcome yeah. to the Here. First of all, you got to show off why you're wearing this jersey. Can you stand up for a minute? Show everyone something. Representing the USA. That's right. not who only he's <laughs> representing. Go no, USA. Right here. Right here. There we go. Right Thank you very much. That is, that is my guy. Right, right here. That is my guy. That is right. love. Um, part of this, I saw you just do an interview and press for this 30 for 30. You right. said you think the best one two punch in basketball ever from the beginning to up to including now was this man and Michael. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> Have they seen the videos of these guys, man, for the last 20 years? I mean, Scotty, we got to give him praise. Absolutely. No, no matter what, you know, they, they want to talk about the. Um, the first year that we pretty much hooked up, I think it was at 88, 87, 88, um, and I guess in the championship game. And the one thing that came out and said, uh, well, Scott is not feeling too well. He has migraine headaches. I'm like, I really didn't think about that. You know, <laughs> they thought this way. Well, Dennis Roman, you're playing too much defense on his ass. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just our turn to, uh, to be uh, the dominant force in the NBA. But um, once these guys got on the road, yeah, they kicked our ass pretty much. <laughs> we were the bad boys then. Well, look, if you can't beat them, you, you join, join them. them. Right, and right. that's really special for me. I, I love that the two of you are here together. It's really nice for me, too. I was a college intern at the Chicago Sun-Times. I was 19 years old when I first met these guys right. during that second three-peat. And Dennis and I were talking in the green room before right. the show. These guys talked to me like I was a real person, not just a 19-year-old girl and all of that. And the respect you guys showed me helped me feel like this was a job I could do. So it meant so much to me to have you guys together here. It always means so much to me to have Scotty here with us, yeah. to be able to revive and talk about some of those old times, which we're going to do throughout this show. Yeah. It's going to be so much fun. Buckle up. Stay with us. Coming up, we're also going to talk a little general NBA because I'm going to ask Scotty and Dennis about their reaction to telling WSJ Magazine that some days he hates the circus of the NBA. I, I can tell you about circus when these guys were going around in 98, but we'll talk about that. First, though, let's go back to the film Rodman for Better or Worse, which debuts tonight on ESPN, 9 o'clock Eastern. Set every alarm you have because this is so good. Dennis, what motivated you to tell this story through the vision of director Todd Capistassi and the voice of Jamie Foxx? I really have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I thought people knew a lot about me uh, over the course of the years and stuff like that. Um, it's more than just a documentary. It's more to, uh, to show people that uh, I'm just not an entertainer. I'm just not a, uh, what they call me back, a circus clown or just a cartoon. I'm more than that. I'm more of a, like an individual that was pretty much um, didn't have any, any motivation to be, to be in, the, in certain situations. I think that sport has gave me an avenue to, to show people that I am something different than being, you know, homeless, uh, being living in the projects. Um, I had a purpose in life, and I think people are gonna see in the beginning that there was no purpose, and then as things start to progress, things start to happen for me. A lot of things start to happen after certain things that took place. But uh, this documentary is so different than any documentary is for sports. It's going to touch a lot of people, especially with the generation, generation to, to today. Mm -hmm. It's going to touch a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, there's so much you learn in this right. documentary right. about you. You touch on being homeless. Right. I didn't know that you were homeless for two years right. after junior college, right? Before, oh, oh, yeah. right? So this was 19 years old, that kind of thing. Your mom had kicked you out of the house. You oh, were yeah. living on the street with a garbage bag. Oh, yeah. And that you didn't know your father. I, I knew that you hadn't known your father until the late right 90s. What do you think, Scotty? Right? You've you seen those days back in uh, what, the Arkansas? Arkansas, yes. Yeah. I mean, oh, come on. Uh, Right? I, you know, I, I followed Dennis' career, and I think he was one of the guys that kind of helped motivate me coming from a small school and knowing that I could make it to the NBA. Uh, he came out of southeast Oklahoma, great rebounder, and I followed him and realized then that I had an opportunity to play at the next level just because of his hard work and his hunger and his journey that, that he had been through. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny to see that journey go through the bad boys once we see you in this documentary right. because the bad boys to us were like, oh, he fit in great with the bad boys. But I want to know how the guy I then saw at the beginning of this documentary who was shy, right, who didn't have anything, 
How did you fit in with the Bad Boy Pistons? Well, Scotty was shy when he came out the NBA. I mean, out the, uh, out of college, yeah. right? I mean, he wasn't the dad really, you know. Yeah, like yeah, I was a little shy, but I, I think how this guy really fitted in with the Bad Boys is because he was a winner, he was a leader, and his basketball IQ is off the charts. And I had an opportunity to experience that playing alongside him. Um, everyone knows that, you know, he was, you know, a part of a great team, but they didn't realize how great a rebounder Dennis was when he was with the bad boys. Right. You I know? know? I didn't know either. And, <laughs> you know, so a, a lot of his individual me. skills never really stood out. But, you know, when he was able to come and join us with the Chicago Bulls, uh, we not only got the greatest rebound of all time, but we got a basketball player that had a very high basketball IQ and he knew how to win. It, yeah. it wasn't about just the, the leaders in Detroit, but they had a great piece here. A guy that was hungry and wanted to be known at the end of the day, as we know now. By the way, he just casually dropped that greatest rebounder of all time. You know he yeah. calls you the groat, right? The groat. The groat. Yeah, <laughs> the groat. Yeah. Yeah. The groat. Right. Pretty good. I do want to show a clip from the film which talks about the mentality of the bad boys and how they treated opposing players like, oh, I don't know, Scotty Pippen. Mm. As unique as Dennis Rodman's playing style was for the NBA in the late 80s, uh -oh. in Detroit, a one-of-a-kind mentality, one that would eventually give them the label, the bad boys, define what the Pistons were all about in the era. We were about disruption emotionally, psychologically, physically. But the main thing that we wanted to do was really crush and destroy you mentally. Uh oh this is ugly. And I think that actually put fear in a lot of people's eyes. The fact that you're gonna get pretty much, you know, up <laughs> if you go, you go come play against us. Here's a fight as Rodman wants to go after Stockton. The Bad Boys was a moniker to a lot of guys on the Pistons. To Dennis Rodman, it was real. Rodman makes the free throw and points down court to Jerry Sloan. It may have been a reflection from when he was younger and he got bullied around and he could now go on the court and, and be that tough guy. He loved everything about that very insulated us against the world mentality that the Pistons had. As we say, tell the kids today, Scotty, can you tell the kids today <laughs> just how vicious it was on the court between the Bad Boys and that Chicago Bulls team in the early years? Because you see little clips here. I don't think people who weren't watching basketball then really get what it was like. No, nah, it was a different game. I mean, we see today's game in the relationships of how these players have grown together and came up in the grassroots of basketball, whereas the, the players that played in the, you know, in the late 90s and on back, there were no relationships really, and we didn't have any love for each other <laughs> out on the basketball court. Uh, we hadn't passed each other nowhere in our career, maybe in college, but it was never that line of communication to build a relationship unless a guy was your teammate. So the, the rivalries back then, they were, they were real, and there were, in, there were no love on the basketball court. Um, you had to know that basketball was, you were being challenged in every way in the basketball game, physically, mentally, um, all that was a huge part of the game. It wasn't just about being able to shoot the basketball, but it was about being able to take a lot and <laughs> give a lot. The environment on the court between you guys, mm -hmm. especially between you guys, what was it like when you guys were going against each other on and walking off the court too? <laughs> there was never any conversation, I can no tell you that. <laughs> no conversation at all. It was a love-hate uh, relationship, but uh, it, it was one of those things where we was coming up in, um, in the Eastern Conference and our main goal was to try to beat Boston. Mm -hmm. We didn't pay uh, Chicago any, any attention. Yep. Um, but uh, little did we know, the more hungry we was getting, the more hungry they was getting. <laughs> so they was right behind us. But uh, once we got past Boston, then all of a sudden here come Chicago Bulls. They got Scotty, that was a missing link pretty much to uh, with Michael mm -hmm. Jordan. But um, it was just our turn at that particular time, as far as 1998, 1990. But I think the, they figured out, went back to the drawing board and hit some weights. And got the mental <laughs> aspect of the game down pat <laughs> and figure how we're we going to really try to come and attack them. But they have something else up their sleeves besides, uh, you know, we can play mental games and we can play the quick game. We can play the 
the agile game, we played a smooth game. They played all of it, and we didn't know how to handle that. What yeah. was the mental back and forth between you guys out on the court? What was the mental warfare? Well, you had Bill Lambert, you had Rick Mahorn, and you had uh, pretty much those two guys were pretty much the enforcers. <laughs> I was pretty much the guy out there just antagonized the hell out of you, just go out there and Nick picked you the whole time. You're not doing this, you're not doing it. But uh, I, I picked up the mentality as far as like, okay, great. If we can't beat them, let's beat them. Yeah. <laughs> let's just beat them, okay? Would he so. talk a lot on the court? Uh, no, I mean, they didn't do too much talking. I mean, to, to look back at that time, it was really about the Detroit Pistons really dominated us mentally. Uh, physically, we were able to catch up, but it was a mental aspect that we had to kind of get over to be able to get knocked to the floor and take it like a man and get up and, you know, knock your free throws down, but understand that we can play that same game on the other end. Don't give up in the layups. Protect our paint because that's what winning basketball was like back in the late 80s and going into the 90s. <laughs> you didn't you didn't give up layups. So right. those those 80 point games were were, were real and yeah. those points were earned and not given. Yeah. And when you did finally beat them and the Pistons are walking off oh, the court, yeah. <laughs> not saying there's no congratulations. It, was, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. They they beat ours, you know, and we put our tails between our legs and we had no choice but to look down and say, you know what, you got us. And uh, in, in front of our own home people, of all places, you never supposed to lose at home. Right. Especially like a rival like Chicago. Did you realize in that moment that that was what it felt like for them? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I, I really didn't because <laughs> I didn't. There's no sympathy. <laughs> no sympathy at all. That team's pride was so high. Right. And they didn't think that they could be defeated. They felt like that their style of play was going to run a lot longer than it did. But to be honest, they knocked down all the dominoes for us. Uh, yes, they were our biggest challenge. They knocked us out a lot of times, but the Boston Celtics was really a team that, you know, they didn't really stand in our way because, you know, it was about the Pistons. Right. And if you're able to beat the Pistons, you pretty much got a championship. There you go. And that's well, what we were able to do. You, you certainly did. You got you got three then, but then you got some more with this guy. And coming yeah. up, we're gonna take a very quick break. But Scotty's gonna tell us in the next segment what it was like inside the Bulls locker room when they found out, oh, one of those bad boys, they're joining your team. What do you remember about feeling from that time? Like I said, I, I came from Oklahoma, and I was like um, in a type of family environment. Coming from the projects, I went to Oklahoma. For three years, it was more like family oriented, and um, I got close with the white family I was living with. Mm -hmm. Then when we went to Detroit, um, Isaiah, <clears throat> Joe Dumont, and Chuck Daly was just embedded to me and said, you know what, this is about a family. We want to win. We got to stick together. We got to do this together. We got to do that. And I said a comment that the fact that we were so damn close, we should be having sex. <laughs> That's how close we were. <laughs> And thank you very much. <laughs> you know what, I said it about it. I said it in a documentary, but it's like, okay, you know, you know what I mean, how close yes, we were. Yes, of course, I'm and, uh, and it's like, when you heard that with Chuck Daly, that really hurt me a lot because he really actually was more like a father figure to me in the NBA. Well, this is what I was going to say. So we heard, saw earlier in the documentary, we talked about it uh, just a few minutes ago. You didn't, the first time you met your father was in the late 90s. Chuck yeah. Daly was a father right. figure to you. You went to Christmas at his house. A I lot. mean, that's, so it's funny, John Sally says there, oh, he didn't know it was a business. I always say this, it is a business, but it's also not a business, right? Well, they well. ask you guys to spill blood for each other on that every court. Every night. Right? Well, so I didn't know about that. When that stuff breaks up, it feels like you're getting abandoned kind of right. all over again. I can see how all of that happened. Right. And then you find out about going to Chicago, and I got to play this clip also <laughs> because this one talks about joining Scotty's Bulls and how that news was received inside of the Chicago locker room. Take a look. The Spurs today traded the controversial Rodman to the Chicago Bulls. To win a championship, you need pieces. And I was at peace they wanted. It was just a match made in heaven, right? Dennis Rodman got ready for Chicago's training camp by revealing yet another new look. Entering the 1995-96 season, the stakes were massively high for Dennis Rodman. Even after playing nine NBA seasons, he was nearly broke. Between taxes and living and an ex-wife and a daughter, he rented a nice house, but he had nothing saved up. 
And also, his reputation around the league had gotten to the point that he was radioactive. Dennis realized that in his own way, he had to straighten out, and he had to play seriously, or else his career was over. Phil, should you get into a situation where he starts rebelling, how will you deal with that? <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. I just love Phil from day one. I've always told Phil, I said, Phil, damn, you realize something? If we was living in the 70s together, we'd be in Woodstock just smoking it up. Bulls had this unique ability of leadership with Jordan and Pippen and Phil Jackson. Of all teams, we can probably absorb this lunatic more than anybody else. Dennis idolized Michael Jordan, almost like a fan. He wanted Michael's approval. <laughs> That's funny as hell, huh? Well, I, people say that. I respected Michael so much what I did. That part Dennis is lying to you about. Dennis Rodman loves Michael Jordan's dirty ass drawers. <laughs> that was not that. Thoughts? 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 Like, I no comments. <laughs> Scotty, Scotty, when he did come, right, and you see a lot, even just in that one minute of, of film we saw, right, and about everything that preceded him, his reputation, he was social media before social media, all that stuff. How comfortable? were you with Dennis as a, having Dennis as a teammate? Did it take you a little bit? It was a tough sale. Um, I definitely can say I wasn't overly excited to get him, mm -hmm. but it didn't take me long to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I knew what Dennis brought to the table. Um, we just felt like that, and I personally felt like that Phil could handle any situation. Uh, Phil was always a father figure for his players, uh, helped guide them on and off the court, and I felt like he would be a great fit for Dennis. Uh, and it, it was a match made in, in heaven, uh, as Dennis stated. Um, we needed something that he could bring to the table, and he brought a lot more to the table than we bargained for. So it was a, it was a blessing in disguise for us. They put it with a lot, though. <laughs> it's a lot with, with the good, the bad, right? Right. The better for worse. Right. But, uh, it was. It was. Uh, it was. Was, more there, like a, was okay. there anything you put them through that you're like, I can't believe I did that? Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I know, but it's like, yes, they did. I did. So, but uh, it, it was funny though how winning and coming together as a team can solve a lot of things. But uh, we never really discussed, like, those three years we were together, mm -hmm. we never really discussed all the, what was going on outside of basketball. We never discussed on the court what was going on outside of basketball about our daily lives. But once we got on the court, it was a whole different ball game. You never yeah. discussed what was going on in no. Las Vegas? Yes, no, 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 any of that. No, I'm yeah, just so, kidding. Yeah, so. <laughs> I remember some of those stories where it was like, you would tell us things and you were like, you can't print that, Rachel. And I'd be like, right. okay. Then I'd like write all this stuff in my little notebook and then be like, like that, but. <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's funny though, Scott has never heard me say this, but I'm gonna say it to him while I'm on national TV around the world. Scotty Pippen is probably the innovator of the power point forward. I, I love Magic, I love Bird, I love Drexler, I love all these guys, but I want the world to know this guy right here, smooth. I mean, this guy, I mean, 6'9". Kevin Durant, Kiss his ass. All the guys, all, all the guys that's, that's 6'9", 6'10", all you guys need to come up with Scotty and please bow down to him. Because he revenue snatched that, that position in the NBA. I mean, you talk about one on two, two on one, stuff like that. One, two guy, Michael, him, Michael, the quickest guy, one, two right here, ever. He's never heard me say this because I've seen a lot of videos of Scotty do. I mean, seriously, on the break, one, two, boom. Mm -hmm. I mean, quick. Well, I will, on the break. I, I will tell you this getting to work with Scotty now, that there are so many of today's NBA players who, when I say, oh, we're going to come do like a special show at training camp or we're going to do whatever, the first request is, can, can Scotty come? Can you bring Scotty? Can Scotty <laughs> oh, be there? Because right. this, yeah. is, this is the, the guy. guy. That was up on their wall. Honestly, him and Tracy McGrady are the two players that we I hear the most. Either I emulated my game after Tracy, which is a different style, or I emulated my game after Scotty. And we have we have two different kinds of guys who say that, but that is the thing I hear the most, and you're absolutely right. And I want to get a little bit more into playing together the championship years. Your integration into the Bulls, Michael Jordan a little bit, because we saw a clip earlier in the show with that. And, and look, again, from being just even a young pup covering you guys, I used to tell people, 
their teammates and their brothers out on the court, but it took a lot of work to get there. And, and, and I always say, people think that leaders today are like, oh, LeBron James is hard on his teammates or whatever, and I always say, right, but Monk, Michael Jordan punched Steve Kerr in the face during a practice, <laughs> right? How demanding was MJ on you as a teammate? Not too much. Okay. <laughs> not, too, not, not too much. I you mean, got off late. The Scotty probably knew better than I do because him and Michael hung out a lot. Right. You know, me and Mike and Scotty, we really didn't hang out too much during the season. Right. I think I was, I was more like the loner in the group, but um, these guys had a special bond. They was with each other for six, seven years beginning before I got there, and um, it was it was fun to watch those two guys really interact with each other. I mean, really, they play against each other in practice, at home playing cars or doing anything that has something to do with physical uh, tasks. And uh, when I watch them in practice and in the games, man, sometimes I sit back and watch. And I'm looking at wrist and cough. I'm looking at, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. there's people that's, that's so gracious on the court. And it's, sometimes you just have to just, oh, God, you know, I'm like a little kid sometimes looking at these guys. And I'm like the one who used to, who used to kick their ass, you know, throw them on the floor, mm -hmm. punch them and stuff like that. Now I'm playing with these guys. So I praised them even more when I was with these guys. But like I said, those days, with, uh, they actually pretty much saved my life, pretty much. Scotty had done so much for me in Chicago sometimes when I was, doing my crazy stuff back home and I had mm -hmm. to come back and they reel me back in and get my focus back on, on, on the game at hand. But uh, they did a lot for me as being in Chicago. They actually opened the doors for me in their hearts. So, and, and the city too. You know what, I, I think it was great for us. Um, that worked out two ways. We right. realized that Dennis was looking forward to rejuvenating his career and it was important for us to get back to being a championship team. So we all needed and wanted the same thing at the end, but what Dennis really brought to us as a team was his leadership and his hard work. Um, but you had to work stuff out between you guys. And you know, I, I asked you, oh, how hard was MJ on you? But you guys were all hard on each other in different ways. And you, you tested them with how much that they would accept, oh, right? Yeah. I tested them, but I don't think they realized that I was doing those certain things off the court mm -hmm. as much as I was. But oh. uh, <laughs> did, you I was, did you not realize it? <laughs> you know what? We did realize that Dennis was living two different lives. Yes. <laughs> but, we also understood that, you know, he was so professional out on the basketball court. I mean, we knew Dennis stayed out to 5 a.m. Someone would tell us, like, Dennis just got back in from Vegas, but... Madonna was on TV yeah. talking about having sex with him. Yeah. So you reali I mean, they was, realized it. Madonna, it was Carmen Electra, <laughs> it was oh, This is a whole big circus, man. Yeah. So, I mean, he brought a lot of... Uh, Social media right to our face. face quick. To, to he was be viral before social media. Yes. That's right. Like, he right? was definitely before his time. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was good though. I, I think I think the, the stars that line, I think God brought us together for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's funny though, Scotty could say something like this as far as, far as that we never really talked off the court. The only time we really actually talk off the court is like we go to a restaurant mm -hmm. and we didn't realize this, but we formed a triangle in a restaurant. Really? <laughs> <laughs> We actually, Mike would be over here, MJ, Scotty would be over there, Dennis. and I'll be over here. We had our own security people with us, but we right. never really interact with each other. We had a triangle going right there, 24-7 <laughs> in a restaurant, you know. So, but uh, but I guess I would never take those days back in. Oh my God! Oh right. I mean, I'm like that was like. Well, ooh. this then gets to how they ended, right? And mm. look, you saw a little bit of in the clip. Right. If management hadn't decided this is Phil's last year, which sounds insane every time I say it out mm. loud, and therefore you guys decided, well, we don't want to do it without Phil. How much longer could the dynasty have gone on? I had no say so. I'm like Scotty Helen this one. Well, I, I mean, no did, I would, you, I would you just guys stay together. I when you look at the landscape of the NBA, if it had been you and Phil and MJ and Dennis, how many more championships could you have won? I would probably say at least two. Okay. I would say at least two. I would I would have loved to have challenged ourselves to a point to where someone could defeat us. Mm -hmm. um, the teams that were giving us the most trouble, Utah Jazz meaning sure. and more in the finals, they were just as old or older oh, than us, right. which gives me the sense that right, we probably could have ran a couple, three more, more years in terms of 
teams that we could beat on the West Coast. Right, and also there was a lockout, right, which lets you yes. rest your old tired bones. That's it. <laughs> that makes me mad, man, because I said, God, can we rerun time? Because we had legs for 50 games. We had legs for 50 games. My God, and I'm like, who really screwed this up? Right. I mean, <laughs> Somebody screwed this up because I mean, I'm I, like, oh my God. I think it about was your Scottie, record. Was Scotty, Michael, <laughs> Phil, Jerry Krause, or I don't know, I, I, whatever. Do you want to tell him who screwed it up? I, I don't know who screwed it up. <laughs> I don't know who screwed it up. I don't really know who screwed it up. Uh, you know, I, I think we all knew going into that last season yep. that that was the end. So yeah. no one really screwed it up. Yeah. It was going to be screwed up at the end. and. We just have to accept that. I just know what your record was in 98 that season, so I'm thinking about what your record would have been in a lockout shortened season. Probably 50 0. Right? 50, <laughs> probably 50 0. I'll predict 50. Right. There you go. Um, and it's funny, this kind of ties into something that's very much in the news today, right now, because mm -hmm. Kevin Durant did an interview with WSJ Magazine, and there was a lot to sort through there, but what caught my eye in terms of you two being on set today was his comments about playing with the Warriors, which is the team that people have said is, oh, are they the greatest team since your Bulls team? Some people, as Scotty knows, tried to say, oh, they were the greatest team, period, more than your Bulls team. And he was talking about his tenure in Golden State, two titles, two finals MVPs. But the quote to WSJ Magazine was, it didn't feel as great as it could have been. He said, I came in there wanting to be part of a group, wanting to be part of a family, and definitely felt accepted, he said, but I'll never be one of those guys. As time went on, I started to realize I'm just different it's not a bad thing, just my circumstances and how I came up in the league. And on top of that, the media always made it KD and the Warriors. So nobody could get full acceptance of me there. Dennis, it was just so parallel to me, to you. You came in and joined a dynasty in progress. Right. Do you understand how KD felt and why he wanted to leave and sort of break <clears throat> that up? Or does it not, not register with you when you compare your experience? I, think, I want to hear this. You want to hear this? <laughs> 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 I think the mentality of, of players today are, are totally different than um, that we had back in um, like the 90s and early 2000s. I think it's very selfish of KD, seriously. You know, really? I don't care if he's listening to this or not. I don't really care. But I think the fact that when you got the opportunity to play this game, especially at a high, high level, especially when you have it this easy, <laughs> this easy to go out there and perform, to make 40, 45 million dollars a year, and literally don't have to play a season and still, and still and appreciate this game. I, I just don't understand. I don't understand why he would even come out and say something like that. I mean, embrace it because in Detroit, I didn't want to leave Detroit. I went to San Antonio. I bust my ass. I want to rebound talents there. Didn't care who was there. I just wanted to win. Left there, <clears throat> didn't turn out too well. Went to Chicago. Wow, embrace. I bust my ass. Want to rebound the talents there in three different uh, mm -hmm. teams. And I enjoyed it. I didn't care who was the leader. I didn't care who was like who was the leading force, who was doing this, this. I just wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to win. I wanted to bring the impact to the city for people to be happy. I didn't care if I played for a dollar, <clears throat> 50 cents. I don't care. I just wanted to win for the city and for the players. And that's all I wanted. But I think players that they do, do not have the, the ability to understand what this game is all about. And for them, for their families <clears throat> and for the community, and I wish they could always remember, it's not always about the money. It's about, are you happy? But that's, I mean, look, on the flip side, that's what Kevin has been saying. KD has been saying, look, this game is more than just titles or money. I need right. to be happy in my life. And you of all people, I would think, would understand wanting well, to go for a new challenge, well, right? Be well, creative. Absolutely. I don't know. The, the, thing that, the thing that I thought is interesting is there's some quotes in there about, like, you know, he says like, he hates the circus of the NBA and kind of everything around it. And again, it just made me think, and we saw it in that clip, the circus around you guys. How would you compare the circus around you to say what the Warriors were? And Scotty, you were right up, you were at those finals games. Like, what, 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 what would you compare it to? Apples and oranges, or is it kind of the same? I think it was a little different back in the Michael Jordan, Dennis Rodman, Scottie Pippen era. Um, I, I think it was a, a different type of fan base. Um, I think that we had created a different era in, in the game at that time. But I, I understand what Kevin is saying, but I also want to let him know that this is a part of our business. This is why he's making all that money, because we've been able to globalize the game through our players, not just what they do on the basketball court, but, you know, using 
digital stuff of them talking and mm -hmm. traveling over abroad mm -hmm. to help promote our game. So it's, it's part of our package to help sell our game because that helps our salaries grow. So I, I don't get what he's saying, especially with a player that's been in the league as long as he has. If he said that two, three years into the league, mm -hmm. then I kind of get it. But you're an established player. Right. You're a, an MVP. So y you weren't fighting the media when you were getting those votes for MVP because had he said some of those things back then, <laughs> believe me, he would not be an MVP today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, following what goes on with the game currently, I know it's part of what you do, but you haven't taken the path Scotty has. You haven't taken the path that, say, Steve Kerr has. He went into coaching. Scotty's gone into broadcasting. You've been doing some other things, and I'm going to make Scotty ask this question because you're going to ask it better than I could. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask so, it. B-Rob, you know, we. I know you back out in uh, – LA now you've been right. in South Florida so what are you doing with your time these these days well right now I'm gonna know my good friend Scotty Pippen right now before that you did some things in North Korea oh, really? which um come on <laughs> really? did you ever expect while you were sitting there with him yeah, in the Scottie, locker room Scotty didn't want to go to North Korea back then he's the <laughs> no. U.S. diplomat no, to North no. Korea I did, I did not want to go at all so well, <laughs> so <clears throat> that's really what I want to know I want to know what's your relationship with uh with with the dictator over in North Korea <laughs> <Dictator>. and <laughs> Are you going to ever bring him to the U.S.? I would love, there you go. I would, like to, I would love to, but Donald Trump won't allow, allow me. Um, I've always said about the, like Kim Jong-un that he, he respected the, the game of basketball. He loved Chicago, the Bulls, mm -hmm. and uh, he loved the fact that Michael Scotty and me, he loved the fact that how we played the game. I was different from the group, but um, he, just want, he just wanted to meet one of the guys on the team pretty much, and Michael decided he didn't want to go and they asked me, and for some reason, the fact that I thought we were just going over to a country, well, I thought we were going to a country just go sign an autograph and play basketball. I didn't know it was like that big of a deal, <laughs> you know, but uh, still going on North Korea. I said, oh, right. great. Da, 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 it's not da. the same as going to like, oh, go in Beijing, <laughs> Beijing. and sign some autographs. <laughs> go autograph. to Tokyo and sign some autographs. But it, it did turn out pretty well for me just because uh, I got to finally meet someone that people in the world kind of like looked up to and not looked up to, but for me, it was more like a learning experience, <clears throat> and, um, and seven years later, you know, I'm here. You know, look at my good friend right here. <laughs> I know. mean, look, it's an experience very few people in the world have ever had or had oh, the yes. opportunity oh, that's favorite. Yeah. to have, and, and that's <clears throat> what's so incredible. And now you've also got business interests that you're working on too, right? I'm always right? doing something, you know that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not behind, you know, closed doors, and mm -hmm. you know, most of the time. But you know, I got this new product, CBD product called Nourish Nourish Group. Dot com so if anybody want to come you know get some CBD from me and stuff like that I'm very healthy <laughs> it's for your skin mm -hmm. for your for your pain everything you have to, and especially it helps you sleep it helps you sleep and stuff like that I recommend it I'm very help nut so is he I appreciate <laughs> my so, 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 I got your gift package right it. your package so we all we all got ace of pain and stuff like that but mm -hmm. it's a good, good product so uh and, and you're doing all things all over too right you're promoting place. this documentary right? documentaries so I got other, other business, going on. other business interests and you know, opportunities. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so anyway, so congratulations to Scotty, his son. Yes. What school is he going to now? Vanderbilt. There you go. Vanderbilt. Yep, appreciate you it. And your son is going to Washington State. There yeah. we go. How about that? The next generation. <laughs> the generation. Yeah. The next generation I, love, right? I love seeing you guys right. together. It is so much fun to sit around and talk about all times. Right. And, and it's just, I know it's as special for everyone out there as it right. is for us at the jump. So thank you yes. guys both for going down memory lane memory with us. Lane right here, right? I appreciate it. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.